to the first 2021 SAI NDE Talking Dead panel. So this is where we have multiple experiencers, including myself, the moderator, who have had six. Uh, and I'll, I'll, what, how, this is how it's going to go. I'll introduce me. I'll introduce, uh, I'll just say who the panelist, and then we'll go one at a time. We've got a lot to cover. So I'm Tamara Calder Richardson, and I am a six-time near-death experiencer, an evidential psychic medium, also a Christ channeler, used to own my own ad, ad agency 27 years. And now I have a YouTube channel called Seeking Heaven, the Near Death Experience, which is an affiliate member, as well as we have other affiliate members uh, on the SAI. You can see it on the website. Um, and I'm also serve on the advisory board as well as the marketing chair. So today we have multiple experiencers. And I wanted to first tell you who is going to be speaking with us today. And I'm very excited about this panel because I believe that as multiple experiencers, um, we're a little bit different, but I'm gonna have them tell you, it's gonna be interesting. So our panelists today are, it would be Raymond O'Brien from the UK, and that it would be the co-founder and president, Dr. Von Kaysen, and the other co-founder and vice president, Robert Baer. So I think what we'll do is we'll have, um, since uh, it kind of seems like that Dr. Case and Robert Baer go kind of, you know, since they're kind of a pair, I would like to have uh, Raymond O'Brien come on first, but let me read before I bring him on a little bit about his background. So Raymond is from England. He's had 12, yes, you heard that right, 12 NDEs. He's had multiple STE, spiritually transformative experiences. He has been a lifelong seer, uh, knowing, clairvoyant, and he is a professional medical intuitive. He's survived multiple cardiac arrest and he suffered um, quite a bit of near-death trauma. Uh, hopefully he'll cover some of that. He, he, he also has, um, uh, I want to talk about his medical profession because he has had training. He has had training. He is a member of the British Association of Counselors and Psychotherapists, and he's spoken also at the prestigious Royal London Teaching Hospital on the psychological effects of surviving a cardiac arrest, whether it be an NDE or STE. He has also published by the John Hopkins University on the subject of near death and the lack of care of understanding in the medical world. And he does a lot. I know uh, I've talked to him. He's also been on my show about working with, uh, working with the cancer unit and he's, he's very impressive. So we are going to bring him on now. All right, there he is. And I'm going to get out of the way and let him take over and you just do your thing. I know you, you've got a big topic here. <laughs> Hanging on by my fingernails is your topic. I can't wait to hear that. So take thank it away. You, thank you, Tara. Hello, everyone. Everyone out there in internet land. I hope you're all all right. Oh, uh, well, ooh, you're in for a real treat. Um, what has it been like? Well, as as just had the beautiful introduction from Tamara, uh, that 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 is quite a number of um, near death experiences. The first ten were through cardiac arrest, and uh, the remaining two uh, were through heart attacks. Uh, and, um, so I struggled massively after the the first events. Um, as Tamara had mentioned, I come from family seers where we where we actually see things that are wrong with people. Uh, and, uh, I'd played this down for virtually all of my life. Uh, I was on a road to ruin, should we say, before my ND struck me down. Um, my beautiful mother, God rest her soul, said something bad is going to happen to you. And I didn't believe her. And, uh, I said, that'd be pretty bad, mum, because you know I've been a bit of a bad boy. She said, it'll be bad. And in love gold it was. So the whole thing kind of started. I won't go into great de detail about the near deaths, but I just just want to give you a, a synopsis of, of, of where things are. The, uh, the first indicators that I had was in New Zealand. I, I felt very crook. And uh, we got back to the UK and I was driving home one day and a little voice in my head said, Raymond, you're going to die. Uh, so lo and behold, that was on a Wednesday. Sunday night came bang, and I was gone. Uh, I spent uh, quite a few days in the hospital. They had put a stent into my heart and said, off, off you go, Ray. Now, I was 
struggling because I didn't recognize my family. I didn't recognize who I was. And before the event, I was seeing horses. Uh, I was uh, working with stud farms uh, just to, to go up to, to diagnose what was actually wrong with the horses um, before the x-rays. So the great thing was is that my work was actually being verified and that was the magical thing. But it, it brought a kind of a conflict with me because I was doing, in, in, in my view, incredible stuff. And then it was being verified. And, you know, to try to, to cope with the, with the trauma of the experience that had happened to me, you know, you, you please bear in mind that I'd lost all, all connection with my family. Um, I, I, I lived a lie with that. You know, I can admit it now. Um, I told my family, but it took a long time to process. They couldn't keep up with the changes that were happening to me, um, and, and nor could I. So I, I, in effect, and you probably hear this from an awful lot of NDE survivors, I cut myself off, I deliberately went into isolation for five years. I just could not cope. And then one day, the very hospital that saved my life asked me to come back and give a talk on the psychological effects. And so I, I came back and uh, in the audience was, uh, was a, a guy Big, tall paramedic. He's given me um, his his kind of permission to, to say his name, Gino. So he came up to me at the end of the talk. He gave me a piece of paper. He said, "You, Ray, you need to study as a as a counsellor." He said, and it just so happens that in the local paper, they're they're running a four year course for it. So if you get in contact with these people, so I did. But in between that, I was asked to come and work on a chemo unit. And this is where I found a lot of things very disturbing uh, to what was going on. And, you know, you, please remember that. Who do survivors go to to find out about what, what's going on? This is what started to, to rear its ugly head. It was one of the negative sides of trying to find treatment. So in between training, doing the first year of training, I still was very, very quiet, still struggling on a psychological viewpoint and still desperately trying to find help. And I was being very unsuccessful. I bumped into a long, lot of psychologists. Uh, but what I was finding, because death is the driver of life. You know, it drives us to do everything, everything from saving for our old age. It's all rooted in death, the end of it. That is the driver. So what I was finding was transference as I was sitting within a practitioner's room is that they weren't too interested in how I was feeling from a, a mental viewpoint. They were more interested in what did you see on the other side, Ray? What was it like? Did you sit at the hand of God? And I found these very troubling questions, very disturbing. But one of the most disturbing things that I found was when I'd probably leave a psychiatrist's office, a psychologist's office, was that I'd walk out of there and I'd, I'd be thinking, what on earth was all that about? I, I, I just didn't get it. But as the course progressed, and I slowly started to process what was, was going on, things took an even more bizarre turn. On the other side, I had met a guy called Fred the Angel. And he looked like Santa Claus to me. That's how he looked, white beard, he had a tanned book. And now I had become ill again, and I was blue lighted back into the very hospital that saved my life. And then from then on, they decided that they couldn't do the technical side of the work. And I had to be sent to a hospital in St. George's, London. So I've, I've ended up in St. George's, London. I'm kind of hand, I'm just hanging on by my fingernails, you know, from a psychological viewpoint. And I've arrived at the hospital, patient transport has taken me up to the eighth floor. And I spoke to one of the ward sisters there. And she said, just stay here, Raymond. We're, we're waiting to, for a bed for you. So I hung around. And it was a little four bedder unit and it was overlooking the houses of parliament so i thought this would be really nice and my bed was right by the window <clears throat> but in the bed parallel to me the curtains were drawn and as i walked towards my bed i heard this soft voice say that's all right father thank you very much i'm also a healer myself so i'm sitting on the edge of the bed and i'm thinking what could be the odds what are the odds of this you know, I've, I've, I've gone through all of this and I've ended up on, on a ward where behind the curtain is another healer. Now, I was classed as a healer. I, I'd actually 
trained to be a healer, which allowed me to work within the National Health Service. The, the, the healing trust is recognized by the NHS. Uh, so it, that was what kind of triggered me. Oh, there's another healer behind them curtains. Anyway, the vicar came out from behind the curtains. You give me a little wave and off he trotted. This nurse came in and she peeled back the curtains. Now, Fred the Angel, who I'd seen on the other side, white beard, tanned book, was now sitting in the bed opposite me with the tanned book. And I was dumbfounded, to be quite honest. I didn't know what to make of it. I mean, we didn't really get on for the first one or two days, but I eventually spent nine days with him. They looked at my heart. They took me up to the operating theatre after I exchanged words with Fred the Angel, it turned out that he knew people that I knew. We went to the same healing group. He'd worked with a wonderful healer. If you want to find out what a true healer is like, check out a guy called Harry Edwards. Just an amazing man. He's no longer with us. But Fred, who's in the bed opposite me, he worked with him. So it was just this magical connection. So they said, Ray, we're going to put you up for a heart op uh, tomorrow. I thought, okay, so I got prepped for it. One of the um, doctors came down, spoke to me, and uh, then they put me into a wheelchair. They wheeled me out to the lift, and I'm talking to this guy behind me. And he said, you've had a real, a real journey to get here, haven't you? He said, we're really surprised that you're still here with us. And I said, yeah. I said, I, I knew what was going to happen. I said, I come from a family of seers. So he said, well, what do you mean? So I started to explain to him about I see all this. So he's still standing behind me, bearing wine, and uh, we're waiting for the lift. And I, I told him, I said, you're an athlete, uh, said, but you haven't ran for quite a while because you, you hurt your ankle. And I was shocked again for me to get this message. I couldn't under, I didn't understand the process. I, I genuinely didn't get it. All I could hear was this voice say, or was it the soul, that this is what is wrong with this body. So he was just about to ask me another question <laughs> and the lift doors opened and here within the UK, I don't know if it's the same where else around the world, but when you get into a lift, the first thing you do is start staring at the wall or looking up at the numbers. Nobody talks to each other. So I could feel the frustration of this, this, this uh, nurse behind me who was, who was wheeling me up to the operating theatre. We get up there, drops me off outside of the operating theatre and he leaves me there. And I'm kind of sedated at this moment, just semi-sedated. And uh, it was interesting to hear what Dr. Grayson said about lucid drugs, because back in the 80s, I used to do an awful lot of LSD. And when I first died in, in the operating theater, I'm a great one for, for when I try to survive, I go through my experiences and try to compare what have I done in my life that would carry me through this experience. So as Dr. Grayson meant, uh, mentioned, the use of LSD and myself being able to compare destinations were, was very similar. So with all of this in mind, I was kind of prepared for what was coming at me again. So they put me onto the operating theater and uh, they had two wonderful cardiologist consultants there and they said what they was going to do. And are you comfortable, Raymond? They said, as they looked down at me, And uh, I, I said, this isn't going to work. And uh, They went, don't you worry, you're, you're with the finest surgeons here in St. George's Hospital. I said, I, I don't doubt that. I said, but I'm telling you now, it's not going to work. So to my right was somebody who was monitoring all of my vitals. And they started to do what they had to do, but they stopped in sort of five, 10 minutes. And I caught a shift. It was a, a somatic shift from the technician who was monitoring my, my heart rate, my vitals. And I thought, here it comes. And the two surgeons said to me, we have to stop for a minute. They, they, they said, we'll, we'll come back. We're just going to discuss what we're going to do next. Anyway, they did. They came back. They said, there's nothing that we can, that we can do. If we work on you, Ray, and we, and we perforate the main artery back to your heart, that'll, you, the, that's, that'll be it. So that's how they left me. So I, with, with this knowledge within my mind, uh, I came back home very, very depressed, very dejected, wasn't at all satisfied, happy with what, how things were panning out for me. But then the call started coming back into me. Uh, people were asking me to see illnesses on them. Uh, so I, I took up the option. And as Tamara said, I ended up working on a chemo unit. And this is where things just became totally bizarre. The interview actually involved me using my seeing, 
skills. Um, I'd spotted on one of the cardiac sisters, uh, sorry, one of the chemo unit sisters. She had an inflamed ovary that was verified. And they said it was one of the most <laughs> informal interviews that I've ever had. So they said, Ray, you know, please, you know, please go and work with us. So I did. And for the first month on the chemo unit, it was, everything was all calm. There was no seeing going on. I couldn't hear other souls talking to me. I felt safe at the hospital. If anything happened, I, I knew that I'd be taken care of straight away. Uh, so it was, a, it was a nice environment for me to work in. And one day I was in there and I was sitting next to a lovely lady. She was having a chemo and People knew why I was on there. They knew that I was there as, as a healer, but nobody would come forward and say, you know, can we have a chat with you? And I was that kind of way too. So it was also really sort of new to me until a receptionist appeared in the, uh, in the doorway. And she, uh, she said, Ray, we've got a patient upstairs who's hysterical. We can't administer her treatment because she's, she's literally on the floor, like hysterical. There's nothing we can do. Can we send her down to you? We told her about you. And so she, she's agreed for this. So she came down. I took her off to my little room. I was working out of the chapel at the time. I was kindly given that. It was wonderful, wonderful place to work out from. And uh, I enabled to calm her down. They was able to give her the treatment. And this was something that really troubled me because this lady didn't have long to live. But we had a private conversation and she explained to me about the, the skills and the abilities that had brought us two together. And I was still full of self-doubt, to be quite honest with you. I, I thought this is this is just a dream. It's all going to it's going to end. I'm going to wake up. And you know, I, I never worked on a chemo unit. She said, do you honestly think that they would leave you alone with me if they didn't have confidence in what you do? And to talk to her, it was, it was magical. I, I think she passed probably two or three, two or three days later. And, uh, so it was, it was a, a bizarre situation. So this was the snowballing of the seeing side of things. This is where it became very, very troublesome for me. My mother asked me to come back home one day. She wasn't feeling too well. Raymond, we have about five more minutes. I can hear okay. you all day. Well, so, but just Thank you. Of course, doesn't it go so quickly? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna fast forward to, to say things went full throttle. I've now, I, I now look at horses. I now look at clients uh, throughout the world. Uh, I am a qualified counselor and, and uh, psychotherapist. I deal with hospitals now. Uh, a lot of the work that I do, uh, particularly through through the seeing, is now verified with x-rays. And, and, you know, just, just kind of think about that for the moment is the things that I'm seeing are now being verified. I'm, I'm seeing tumours, you know, two years before the MRI machine will, will see them. And, you know, the best way for me to handle this is almost like looking at the stars. You know, you just think, I, I don't know what's out there, so I'm just not going to question it. But still the people keep coming. Still, people ask me what is wrong with me. You know, even up, even up to, even up to yesterday. To, to be quite honest with you, it's 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 a snowball effect that just goes on. People say, "How do I how do I do it?" The soul talks to me. It's it's that's all I can say. It, it talks to me. Um, I clearly remember in the ER room sitting on my forehead, my soul, and I watched everyone around me work. So it was identifying those differences between the two. Um, it's, it's, it's a remarkable skill. It's a skill I teach. Um, I combine it with uh, validated working modalities, uh, which are passed by the NHS, but I combine it with the spiritual viewpoint. And for me to, to help other NDEs, it, survivors, is a wonderful thing because I get it. And this is the main thing that a lot of people say to me who come to see me. You understand, Ray, you don't re-traumatize me. You know what questions to ask. You can tell by just by the way my body language is. So it's, it's been a wonderful, a wonderful culmination of using validated working modalities, 
uh, from a psychological viewpoint to using the holistic side of, of, of the work that I do. So, you know, to, to be here with SAI and be allowed to talk like this and to be in such company, it's, it's, it's a real honor for me, to be honest. Um, and ultimately, the reason why I am here is, is not for self gratification, ego, it's to help you who are out there who think, who do I turn to? Who can I turn to? Who is a professional who can give me an answer about what is wrong with you without re-traumatizing me? You know, my mission is not to put people through what I went through. And, you know, I suffered massively by some who thought they could help, but clearly couldn't. It was out of their field. So it's, it's you know, this is the issues. When you have somebody saying what you've said to me, I have struggled with over for 20 years. It's, it's, it's a remarkable thing. So, you know, it's a wonderful thing to have survived, trust me, uh, but it does come with its wonderment, the trauma of wonderment about what I do. And, uh, you know, and, and you know, to, to go back on what I've just said, to be verified for the work that I do, it does still trouble me, uh, you know? So I, I'm still looking for somebody who, can, who I can sit down with. And, and then, you know, I want to find another Raymond. That's, the problem that I have with this. That's my negative viewpoint. So it's, 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 it's a wonderful experience to be here and be allowed to say this. Thank you so much for all that. And we're gonna, we, we have a Q and A and I'm sure there's gonna be so many questions for you, but I love the fact that you do let people know that this is not <laughs> glamorous, that there is trauma. So thank yes. you for sharing that. Yeah, I try You're to welcome. make that clear to people. It's not all roses and- It isn't, is it Tamara? It can be very difficult quite often quite often and I think that needs to be validated and verified. Uh, I totally agree. So thank you for, you know, being vulnerable and saying that. Uh, You're that welcome. True. Thank you. Thank so you. we're going to come back to you, but now we're going to introduce, thank you so much, Raymond, Dr. Arvon Kaysen, and I am going to, uh, let's see, um, let me, let me move you out of here and add, uh, let me put me back. Why don't I do that? Okay, here I am. All right. So let me introduce very quickly, and I'm not going to shorten you. <laughs> Keep on talking. I'm not going to shorten this bio because it's pretty impressive. So I, I do want to get through this. This is uh, I want to introduce the co-founder and president, Dr. Yvonne Kaysen, and she is from Canada. And I want to read a little bit about her bio. She has had five near-death experiences and multiple spiritually transformative experiences, which she coined that term, and STEs. And she has um, been to the heavenly white light realm. And she has also been greeted by saints and uh, beings of light who telepathically communicated and still do, I'm sure, communicate with her. She had a state of pure knowingness. She um, also, I wanna get into her bio a little bit, uh, her book is fantastic. Touched by the Light, if you haven't read it, it's very good. She lists just about every kind of spiritual experience or indie you could possibly imagine. And I actually learned a lot about myself reading it. She uh, was a uh, Canadian medical doctor and she was also, uh, she was a full MD and also a psychotherapist um, as well as a family physician. She's been, she was the past president of the International Association of Near-Death Studies as well as the co-founder and co-leader of Toronto Awakening Sharing Group and a member of ASCII, the American Center for Integration of Spiritual, uh, Spirituality Transformative Experiences. And she's the co-founder of the Kundalini Research Network and Spirituality and Healthcare Network. And she currently lives in Toronto. So I would like to bring her on and have her tell us uh, her story. Here we go. Thank you for being here, Dr. Kaysen. And thank you for this conference. Thank you, thank you, Tamara. I'm going to cut my story a bit short because we're, uh, I've gone a bit over time, but I wanna let everybody know this is my book, Touched by the Light. And everything um, I'm gonna be talking about is in my book. <laughs> so um, this panel is called the NDE Talking Dead panel. And um, when Robert Bear and I came up with this idea of having this panel, it was because we felt there was a difference between people who've had NDEs and who've not had NDEs, 
but also there's a difference when people have been clinically dead during their NDE compared to people who'd not been clinically dead. And I can say from my own personal experience, this is really true. Um, I've had five near-death experiences over the course of my life, as Tamara pointed out, and I do mention all, I do describe all five of them in my book, if you want to get them in more detail, but I'll just say briefly, I had one at the age of five, which was an out-of-body type of near-death experience. I had one at the age of 11, that again was an out-of-body type of near-death experience. And then I had my first mystical near-death experience uh, in 1979 in a, in a plane crash, but again, I was close to death in all of these or unconscious, but I was not clinically dead. And then my fourth NDE happened in 1995 in a uh, near miss plane incident. And this one, I went out of body and up through a tunnel and had a life review, saw being of light. But again, I was close to death. I was not clinically dead. In my fifth near death experience, which is the one that I'm going to share with you today, is I was clinically dead for a period of time. And it felt very different for me to have a near-death experience where I was actually clinically dead for a period of time. And actually for a long time, I didn't even wanna call it a near-death experience. I wanted to call it a death experience because to me, it was a death experience. That was the first time I'd actually experienced death. And let me tell you a bit about it. In the time that we have, I'm going to give you a very shortened version of it. But basically, it happened November the 8th, 2003. I had a slip and fall accident at Niagara Falls, Canada. I slipped on black ice, fell back and hit my head. And I had uh, I hit my head on rock and I died instantly. On a, on a physical plane, I suffered a serious traumatic brain injury with a brain hemorrhage and I died. And what I experienced inside my soul was I, all of a sudden, I was no longer in my body and I was whisked by a force greater than myself. It all happened so quickly. I was whisked by a force greater than myself. And I, I seemed to go up through a dark expanse of space. Some might call it a tunnel. To me, it was just like a dark expanse of space. And then I fought, suddenly found myself in this white light realm. And it's the same white light realm that I saw in my near-death experience, plane crash near-death experience in 1979. But this time it was different in 1993. This time when I entered the white light realm, I was greeted by two beings of light and they were saints from my spiritual tradition that I recognized immediately. They were Paramahansa Yogananda and Mahavatar Babaji in their light bodies. And they were it was like they were welcoming me. The energy that I felt was, it was all telepathic, intuitive feeling, not through words being spoken. I, it was of welcome. It was of joy. It was like there was a graduation party being celebrated in my honor when I arrived in the light. Like the feeling was job well done. You know, your work is over. You made it. You graduated. You, you're here now. And so it was telepathically explained to me that I had died. And I remember that my first thought after I realized that I had died was, uh oh, <laughs> You know, because I heard a lot about near-death experiences, been researching it for so many years. I thought, uh-oh, here comes the life review, right? And nobody's perfect, and I've made mistakes in my life. And that was really what I was feeling was, uh-oh, here comes the life review. And, and so it was so interesting because these two saints, these two beings of light, they could read my thoughts, like they knew what I was thinking and they just like glanced at me and it was like with a, with a poof, like with a poof, they communicated an understanding that just blew away my fear about my life review. And the understanding I had was, it really doesn't matter. You know, and it's the understanding was just like when a young child is learning how to walk, it stumbles, it makes mistakes, it bumps its head, it skins its knees. It's all part of the learning process that the divine mother, father, God, whatever word we use for the higher power understands that. And really all of this crud doesn't really matter in the big scheme of things. And so I just felt incredible love, unconditional acceptance, unconditional joy. And then I shifted. And it's like, 
I stopped seeing anything visually and I shifted into a realm of what I call pure consciousness, like pure thought. And in this realm of pure consciousness or pure thought, it was like my, my, I was able to take in vast amounts of information all at once with like massive computer download from all directions. And, and I suddenly, uh, Simon talked about a bit this a bit this morning when I was interviewed on his show because I talked about this on his show. But what happened was suddenly it was I re remembered like I no longer forgot all of my past lives. And I had known about some of my past lives before, but now suddenly it was like, I remembered all of them and they all fit together. And it was exactly like a jigsaw puzzle where, where I used to have a few pieces and now I had all of them, they were all put together. I could see the whole picture. And it was like a real aha experience of why I'd had this, what I consider rather weird life as Dr. Yvonne Kaysan, having all these STEs and a Kundalini awakening and mystical experiences and near-death experiences and all sorts of psychic phenomena. I could write a book about them because guess what? I'd had almost every kind of them. So, so uh, it suddenly made sense to me when I remembered all of my past lives in this realm of pure consciousness that, that I realized I'd had STEs for many, 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 many incarnations, and that this was not the first incarnation that I was having NDEs or STEs. And so my soul was sort of continuing on from its journey from many incarnations in the past. It all made sense. The other thing that I experienced in this realm of pure consciousness was that time was not passing the way that it passes here on earth. And what I was experiencing was it was sort of like past, present, and future were all coexisting as if they were all almost happening at the same time. And it was more like which way you, you focused your attention, whether you were looking at the past or the present or the future, that they were all somehow there. Like um, I compare it to uh, you go to a, some square, you know, in New York or something where there's like, you know, 20 different movie theaters around and they might have one particular actress, this time me, appearing in different movies, right? And all in these different theaters that occur in all different times. So you might think, well, I can't be having all of those experiences at the same time. But in Times Square or wherever this is, you get it. They were filmed at different times, but right now we are seeing the films all at the same time. So it was sort of like that. It was, it was, I understood while I was in that realm of consciousness how, how we exist here on earth when we're incarnated in our bodies. It feels like lifetimes go one after the other. But on the other side, it was much more fluid. <laughs> And we could be having several incarnations at the same time and overlapping. And it's also not linear. Like you think you have to have your lesson after the experience where you didn't learn your lesson. Well, maybe it didn't happen that way. You know, maybe things are, time is so completely different on the other side. So anyway, after a period of what I call timeless time, because really there was no sense of time passing. It was just so completely different, the sense of time on the other side. The two beings of light reappeared to me and they telepathically communicated to me, you may now choose. And the choice telepathically communicated was whether to reincarnate in the body of a baby to further serve the divine, and or, interesting, the choice was and or, to return to the injured body. And when I was in that state on the other side, it might, it, the, what we think of as our intellectual brain, it was like on siesta or something because it was my heart that responded. My heart was wide open. And so my brain didn't go, well, what do you mean uh, going back and blah, blah, blah. No, you know, I wasn't asking questions. My heart was just open, accepting and filled with love. And what my heart responded was, oh, masters, please guide me. What is the higher choice? I want to do God's will. And then they lovingly, so lovingly, telepathically communicated to me, it will be more difficult, but to return 
to the injured body. And immediately my heart responded, I accept. And it was so fast. It was faster than the speed of thought. It was between the thought I and the thought accept that <gasps> with a gasp of air, I found myself back in my physical body and I'm lying on the ground. And it was like waking up in an ice cube because this was outdoors in winter in Canada. And my body temperature must have dropped. I started breathing life back into my body. And for the first few minutes, I could see both realms like they were superimposed on each other. So I was in the, my physical body. I could see the physical world, but I could also see the white light realm completely clearly with my physical eyes open. And I could see the two beings of light, the two saints. It was like they had instantly, faster than thought, come with my soul and escorted me back into my body. And then they gradually faded from view. And I found myself back in my physical body, uh, breathing life into it. Now, I was going to tell you the story about my healing experience, but because of time, um, I'm going to leave that out. I have it in my book. I was disabled with a traumatic brain injury um, from this uh, accident. And it was what I call a heaven and hell experience. So I can connect to what Raymond says, where do you go for help? You know, people think, oh, because you had a near death experience and you saw the light, you're not going to have any distress. Well, hello, I had in my body, I had like a post-traumatic stress syndrome. You know, if there was any ice, I would have a panic attack. I would have an anxiety. This was my physical body. I'm not afraid of dying. I know it's beautiful on the other side, but like my physical body would go into this intense fear reaction. And then similarly, you know, people say that the horrible, cruelest things to you sometimes, like somebody said to me, boy, Yvonne, you must have some really bad karma that you got sent back as a disabled person. And, you know, I thank God for that powerful near-death experience because I knew that wasn't true. I knew that God's plan was loving. And even though I didn't understand why I had to come back disabled, I knew there was some loving higher wisdom behind it and that it was not a punishment. And it was like a life ring in the storm because the real life challenges of being disabled and how are you gonna pay your bills and how are you gonna get to your doctor's appointment when you have new physical and cognitive challenges, you know, just the fact that you've been on the other side doesn't eliminate all of those real life problems that you have to deal with and the misunderstanding and the judgment and all those sorts of things. So what I'd like to wrap up with is what have I learned? I think what are the most important things that I've learned by having had five near-death experiences, multiple STEs, but also of actually having been dead, you know, the talking dead and then being sent back. And so I would say, number one, the most important thing that I've learned from all of this, and it's probably obvious to all of you, but I have to say it, is that we are more than the physical body. We are a spirit that happens to be in this body for a while. And it's like shedding some old clothes that are worn out when we leave the body. And then we get a new pair of clothes to come into when we incarnate again. So that we are this immortal spirit that comes in and out of the body. And it can be a near-death experiences, it can be an out-of-body experiences, et cetera. But we are truly the spirit, consciousness, soul, whatever words you're gonna to put to it. And yes, we survive death of the body and absolutely we reincarnate. I mean, to me, it's not a hypothesis. It's a, I know it because I remember my incarnations. And can you meet yourself in another incarnation? Why, yes, I have. I am on the planet right now in another incarnation as a man, and I have met this person. Um, I have no idea if they know <laughs> that they're me, but I know that I'm them. <laughs> so who knows? That's part of the divine mystery of things. And yes, incarnations can overlap. And, and you know, the other thing I learned by being on the other side is that we are much too hard on ourselves. You know, that, that when I think about that incredible amount of love that I, you know, had that fear about my life review, it's like, oh no, <laughs> you're yeah, I've not been
been a perfect person. I do my best, but I'm a human. And how with such incredible love, just incredible unconditional love, it was just like, don't worry about it. And and that really four minutes. So keep okay. on. <laughs> All right, Tamara. So, so that really, I want to make sure Robert gets his full time to talk. So I'm going to wrap up that really, um, that, that we need to learn to love ourselves and to uh, give ourselves a break that we are here to learn and grow. If we were already perfect, we wouldn't have to be here to learn and grow. And, and the other point is this, is that People argue, is there a higher power? Is there a God? To me, it's not a theory. To me, it's a reality. I know there's a higher power. There's an intelligence behind the universe. And uh, how we, what name we call it, whether it be Allah, Great Spirit, God, Brahman, it, that has to do with what culture we, broke up, we grew up in. And I saw myself incarnated in so many different cultures as men, as women, dying young, dying old, spiritually advanced, not spiritually advanced, that, that this was all part of my soul's journey. And that, um, but it is the same one higher power, this intelligence behind the universe that is running the whole show. And when I was sent back, I was given a very strong message which was pass on what you have learned. And so my brain, I had a spontaneous brain healing experience, which was a miracle 12 years after my, my last near death experience, I was disabled till then. And this book, Touched by the Light, is the first book that I wrote after my brain healing. So it is passing on what I have learned. And the co-founding of Spiritual Awakenings International with Robert Baer was also part of the mission that I was given to pass on what I have learned. So I'm so glad to, that you're all here sharing in our one year birthday. And uh, I'd like to leave it at that and pass it on to our next speaker. Wow, that was beautiful. Ah, oh, I mean, so powerful. So thank you so much, Dr. Kaysen. Uh, we have questions coming in for everybody. So there'll be more with everyone. So for right now, I'm gonna go back and introduce uh, our next guest, our next panelist, which is the co-founder and vice president of SAI, which is Robert Baer. Now um, I'm gonna have to speed, he's got a big bio, so I'm gonna speed through this a little bit, but he has had uh, three near-death experiences and he had this happen, one, he had uh, two of them in the same day, which was March 22nd, 2009, which is interesting, that's my birthday. He says that's his rebirth day. So we had a chuckle over that. And when he was boarding an airplane, he uh, died of a heart attack, 45 minutes. So it's, it's a fascinating story. Um, hopefully he'll tell us some uh, about that. But he, he has been, before we go into his big bio, he has been profiled in the TV show, I Survived beyond and back and he also was a case study by author deborah diamond in her book life after near death robert has interviewed for an upcoming episode on william shatner's show which is also born the 22nd <laughs> called unexplained on the history channel uh now a little bit of back uh, about robert robert uh is a retired police officer he used to be a chips police officer and he was with the Santa Cruz Police Department and then the California Highway Patrol from 1970 to 1992. He attended the West Valley College in San Jose State and the University of California, Santa Cruz and the University of San Francisco, where he graduated with a master's in public administration and a PhD in business, as well as two other teaching credentials. After he retired from law enforcement, he worked on a variety of positions. Uh, he's done a lot a professor, a general manager, a city administrator for three communities, an executive director of a community resource center, the tribal administrator for 
Native American nation and, uh, and staff executive consultant. And he's also worked for an international consulting company. He's done quite a few things. City Planning Commission. He's been on the County Drug Free Coalition, the Commission on Ch uh, Children and Families, and the president of Local Humane Society. And he served on the California Special Districts Board of Directors and the California Special Districts Workers' Comp uh, Compensation Board. And he has been recognized as the Peace Officer of the Year in 1976 and nominated, nominated as a Special District General Manager in 1997. And currently, Robert lives in Oregon and he is a grant and technical writer. So, well, whew, I gotta take a breath. I gotta have a glass of water after that big resume. So go ahead and uh, tell us your story. Thank well, you. Thank, I wanna thank everybody for being here for this um, panel. Um, it is something that uh, Yvonne and I uh, kicked around and talked uh, talked over because we both have uh, passed away um, at NDEs and came back to life, but we both had a situation where we uh, were exposed to the higher power when we were deceased. Same thing with Raymond and the same thing with Tamara also. So that's one of the reasons we're having this panel. And I've been blessed. I be I can't really talk about this a whole lot in the 20 minute segment that I have. But uh, Netflix was just out of my place to uh, spend a weekend with me. They're going to do a documentary on me. So uh, that'll be coming out. So that'll probably give you more of a background than than what I have to talk about here right now. But uh, I've had a total blessed life. Dying was actually something that uh, was hard to accept, hard to come back from, but I've had 4,467 additional days of life. To give you an example, uh, Michael Jackson, the rock star, died about the same time I did, and when he passed away, they took him to a special doctor in uh, the Los Angeles area who was renowned for raising the dead, and that man could not revive Michael. I had a doctor in Phoenix, Arizona that was able to do that to me. I was deceased for 45 minutes. Uh, Tamara was right, I was boarding an airplane, had a massive heart attack. There were a lot of circumstances that led up to that. Uh, one of them had to be, I had, I had, my mother was at the foot of my bed before this happened. She'd been deceased in 2005 and she appeared in front of, in front of me at the foot of my bed and told me, this was at, in uh, 2008, at the end that I was gonna die, get my uh, affairs in order. And, uh, but I'm telling you, my mother looked young, vibrant, vibrant and beautiful. It was so good to see her, but I didn't sleep for a couple of days after that. Um, I had a physical, full physical, passed it with flying colors where you have the uh, treadmill and you have the blood tests, the urine tests and all the different things. So I kind of put that in the back of my mind. And then a friend of mine, a police friend of mine called me. And um, when, when you had a, having a career like I had, I had a 23 year career being a policeman. You have, you have a pretty good camaraderie with people, but you have a different outlook in life. Um, you're kind of cynical. Uh, you're narrow-minded, and you're not very tolerant about a lot of things. And this came back and hit me real hard when I passed on. But he asked me, my friend asked me, he said, I feel compelled to call you and find out, are you right with the Lord? And I said, what? And he goes, yeah, I, I have to know this. And I said, well, I think so. And we were talking uh, to one another. and. Short time later, he passed away. And a couple of months after he passed away, just before I was on my way to go to Arizona where I had my massive heart attack, um, he appeared at the foot of my bed. And he looked like he did when we were young, when we were young policemen in the 60s. He told me he was gonna bring me through the light. And I said, what are you talking about? So I'm going to bring you through the light. 
I got to go. I want to visit my grandkids in Sacramento. Lo and behold, I mean, I was in a pool of sweat. I thought I was having a, a bad dream or whatever, but it wasn't a dream. It was a reality. And I called around and I found out that, yeah, his grandkids did live in Sacramento. So I verified that. But I got, I got, I got to Phoenix, Arizona, visited with my son and my granddaughters, went to the airport, wasn't feeling well, got on a plane, and I passed away of a massive heart attack. I was very lucky. There were a couple of, of uh, people there that were uh, off-duty firemen from the Pacific Northwest. They started giving me CPR and knew how to work a defibrillator, but that had no bearing on me. I, I was gone. I don't remember anything about that. I was gravitating into a light. And somebody was with me. I don't know who it was. And there was more than just one person or one soul. I like to think it was my friend who told me that he would take bring me through the light because he's the type of guy that would. Gravitated up in this beautiful, it was just beautiful. The colors are not on this earth. Warm, loving, absolutely phenomenal. But then it began. I was in the realm in the presence of a higher power. It still bothers me every time I talk about this because it was so humbling. I could not look at the higher power, but I was asked a question. And I don't know how what language or it may have been in our minds, but I understood what, what I was asked and that had to do with what good had I done in my life. And the next thing I know, I started the life review and it went from the time I was conceived until the time I died. And it was a reckoning for me personally because I had a lot of power in life, took people to jail, uh i was a boss where um i did personnel issues hired people but fired them um i mean i had a lot of power in my life and when i saw the all the different scenarios play out not only could i feel my involvement again but i could feel their interpretation of how they felt about me and what my actions had done to them. It was a real humbling experience. And uh, it still haunts me to this day. And I know my time's short. I have to say this. While I was having my life review, something was fidgeting off to my right. I remember this specifically. And I looked over to the right and my dog that had passed away in 2001, who was one of my just the best friends I ever had. I looked over and there she was wagging her tail. I thought I had no idea that animals went to where I was at that time. She couldn't come to me, but I specifically remember that. And I know I'm running short on time, but I wanna say this. SAI was created by experiencers for experiencers. We en encompass all varieties of uh, spiritually transformative experiences, uh, whether it's NDEs or Kundalini awakenings or whatever. But where this panel has been, there's no videos, no pictures, no way to account it. All you have is our, is our dialogue of what we're telling you. It's no different than like, I've said this before in my talks, whether it's been Christopher Columbus, uh, Marco Polo or Mark Twain or whatever, where they went on their adventures, on their experiences, they came back to report to uh, Marco Polo or Christopher Columbus would be to the queen. All they had, was to tell them what they had saw because there were no videos. There were no pictures. It's just their experience. So what we're telling you is what we experienced and 
whether you want to believe it or not, that's up to you. But I would, and I'm not running out of time here, I would definitely take the time to look at our YouTube videos and also other ones that uh, of persons that have talked at SAI, they're up on our website. Raymond's got a great one. Yvonne's got a great one. There's plenty of other ones out there. Um, and judge for yourself what we went through as far as the NDE experience. Now, when I passed away, I was taken to the hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. I had a doctor that revived me. When I was revived, I had another type of near-death experience where I actually was on top of the, the bed watching them work on me in the, in the uh, emergency room. And I could see the, the monitor flatline and I could hear them kind of panicking a little bit. But my attention was drawn to another part of the hospital where there were a couple of, of people in the admissions office that were going through my wallet. And instead of being concerned about myself dying, I was look more concerned about what they were doing going through my wallet. Well, as they were doing it, I was trying to tell them where my insurance cards were because that's what they were talking about. And policemen carry, a lot of them carry two, we carry two wallets. One has our police ID in it, one has a regular ID. And my um, insurance card were in my police ID. So they were going through my stuff and all of a sudden they found my police ID and opened it up. And I heard them say, wow, oh, this guy's a retired policeman. And I ended up being revived right at, shortly right after that. But when I was in intensive care, I was telling the, card, the doctor about it. He went and grabbed or got the two people, that, the two clerks, brought them to my bed in intensive care and had me tell them exactly what I had saw uh, when they were going through my wallet. I told them and I told them what they had said. And they said, that's exactly what happened. So if one of us gets up, talks about a life review, or talks about an out-of-body out of experience where we're hovering over, watching them work on us in a hospital bed or whatever. There's more than one type of experience, NDE experience. And that's what I want to emphasize today. I've had those two and I had another one where I had a bleeding ulcer and was bleeding out. And I was actually alongside the bed in the hospital watching them work on me. So, I had three different types. Yes. So five minutes, however you want to wrap it up. I could listen to you all day. <laughs> well, here again, I have, it's just a real honor to be here. And it's such an honor to be alive. And to be able to come back to life, uh, I took the time, uh, some, I even looked up some of the people uh, that I felt real guilty about my interactions with them. And um, I did my best to apologize to them. Um, SAI is really good because I can't talk about my near-death experiences with my police friends. I couldn't talk to them with my family. I needed, a, uh, I needed an outlet. And I've found that with Yvonne and with Linda and with Raymond and with Tamara and all of you that, are, that have tuned in today. This is a great movement that we've started here. You know, there was a time they would have burned us at the stake, some of us, if we said we heard voices or whatever. But um, that's, that's not the case. Uh, we're here for awareness. I wish I could get into my experience a little bit in more detail, but please check out the videos, the television shows, same thing with Yvonne's, with Raymond's, with Tamara's. Tamara, by the way, has a tremendous podcast. The Seeking Heaven thing is just tremendous. And uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robert. I made it. But no, I mean, you're right. There's just so much. I mean, everybody's got so much. Is How do you shorten with all these experiences? I understand. But this is a good segue because someone does uh, our first question. So start typing your questions. But we do have a question uh, and this is for you, Robert. 
So after the life review that haunts you, what would you do differently? And let's see, how do you live life now in comparison? And that is from Shine. Well, I can't take back anything that happened. I mean, what's happened happened. But I made a real effort to try to not affect other people's lives, uh, at least in a negative manner. Everything I try to do, I try to do in a positive manner. Um, and the, the one thing I've learned, uh, I have to say that Dr. Uh, Yvonne Kaysan has been a big influence in my life because I found out more about some of the other things that's happened to me in the past. And uh, it's almost like having a psychotherapist. Um, and, um, and I learned to recognize a lot of things. I've said this before about Raymond, since Raymond's here. We were in Philadelphia. He was from England, I was from Oregon. We were in a, we were in a hotel bar and I saw him <laughs> and we connected. I know him, I knew him yeah. from, and believe me, I would have never believed in past lives, reincarnation. I'm wide open now. It's just, uh, it's amazing what this has done to me. And um, getting back to the question, yes. I try to treat everybody like I would want to be treated. That's, that's, I'm why done. Don't, why don't I bring out all that? This is a good time to bring everybody on. What do you think? Let's bring, let's have a party. We, we, we are all on. Oh, we are in the, in the view? Yeah, you're not oh. seeing it. Yeah, we are all okay, on right good. now, Tamara. Perfect. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted to put us all in little squares and so forth. No, we're all here. Okay, good. <laughs> My view is different. Great. So uh, let's go ahead and do some more questions. So did you finish that? What would you do differently except treat people kind? And you were, were you done when that? That's, that's basically it. I'll tell you, my life work is dedicated. I write grants for homeless people, uh, disabled veterans, uh, seniors, humane societies, fire trucks. What are you, uh, I've dedicated my life work to, and now it's Spiritual Awakenings International. Yeah. It's my passion. This is what we're supposed to be doing. The four of us right here. I think we've all been together in a past life. So mm -hmm. here we are. Yeah, here we are again. Yeah, I know that too. It's it's cool. It's a good feeling. It's like uh, being back together with family. So I have a question for Dr. Kaysen, and this is um, this is from Anna Gonzalez, and she uh, is on the Spanish panel. She, uh, she has a question. Uh, you as a doctor, which is the moment? Oh wait, in which the, that uh, in which they declare you dead, and after a certain amount of minutes. Oh, it's skipping. The questions are popping in like crazy. After a certain amount of minutes, uh, after your heart stops, I've been asked this. How do you know when you were dead? Uh, I guess maybe the question would be, would be how, clinically dead versus dead, because that comes up. People ask me that a lot too. Well, okay. I, I can just talk to you from my experience, Anna. Thank you for that question. Um, when my head hit the ground and I suffered my traumatic brain injury, the physical sensation was like being chopped in the head with an ax. It was just unbelievable, excruciating pain, but it, I, instantaneously I was out of my body and I was gone. Now, um, I was told telepathically when I was on the other side that I had died. And so that is how I know that I was dead. In my four other near-death experiences, there was no hint of that. They were all near death. You know, I was unconscious or close to death, uh, or facing death, but I was never clinically dead. Um, but this one, I was immediately told I was dead. And I had, as I described, this incredible experience of celebration. It was over. And then the revealing of my past lives. So... When I came back to my body, the experience I had on the other side felt much, much, much longer than the time that had passed on the earthly frame. So on the earthly frame, maybe I was dead for who knows, X number of minutes because it wasn't witnessed, uh, could have been half an hour, could have been 20 minutes, who knows. 
but it felt much longer than that on the other side. So um, my body died and uh, my spirit clearly didn't. <laughs> great, great answer. Okay, here we got some more for Raymond. This is from Jody. Uh, so let me pin Raymond here and have him. Here we go. Do you give healings advice to people who are reg who are regular doctors uh, with no tests or cures for how can you be reached? I, I don't know. I'm not really. Uh, let me read that again. I'm not really sure of the question. Sorry about that, Jody. Uh, do you give healing help or an advice? To, I guess just to regular people, or is it just doctors? So, um, what is your um, what are your services you're, or you're willing to offer? Um, my, that's my a good service. question. Uh, yeah. Hi, Jody. Thank you for for uh, for joining us. Uh, yes, I do. Is your answer to uh, to people and to doctors? I've worked on quite a lot of doctors um, within their surgeries, which which is a wonderful thing because you know doctors like to see results, and uh, and, and and that is exactly what I've done. I've worked in the Istanbul American Hospital. I worked on doctors in there. Just done profound work. So um, yeah. Um, contact me, type in Raymond O'Brien and just look for the hair and, and, and uh, you know, <laughs> and we'll go on from there. How's that, Jody? Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that answer. And we have something, I don't know who wants to take this because it's kind of interesting. Um, let me put, uh, this is, oh, <laughs> okay. Question for all the panelists. This is from Mindy. I feel connected to many beings on earth in addition to humans, animals, plants, rivers, places, and wonder what your NDEs might have to tell us about. Let me put it back on me. I guess that would be the right thing. Uh, what that would tell us about uh, your NDEs what would it, uh, and any of those non-human experiences happening here on earth. So I guess, um, I don't know. Do any of you have you had non-human? I just I don't know if non-human means creature or humanoid, but we'll leave that open. Um, May I answer that? Yes, please. Um, I actually work on horses, animals, dogs, cats, uh, you name it. As I mentioned earlier, I traveled the world doing that before I had my cardiac arrest. Um, so yes, it was the NDE that really heightened everything, tuned everything in. It was almost like you will listen. It was a lot of scruff. You will listen to what's got to be done. And uh, so, yeah, I've, I've worked on an awful lot of animals. Uh, the connection is just wonderful. It's that, as, as, as Robert said, Yvonne has said, uh, it's, they talk to you. And, uh, you know, I, I looked at five horses, picked out all five. The last horse I said is blind in his right eye. I was in New Zealand uh, when I picked out the, the horse with the blind right eye. They said, no, this horse is a show jumping horse race, just come back from wherever. And uh, they contacted me in New Zealand and said they had to take the horse to the vets because he was bumping into things and he was blind in his right eye. It's called Sparky. So, uh, but just so, so they speak to us. You just need to listen to yourself and it's the sensitivity and you'll pick it up. You know, do the most basic skills with yourself, test yourself, you know, write down what you're hearing and then verify that later on. So there's lots of ways to enhance your skills. Trust me, there is. That's true. I agree. That's a beautiful answer. Thank you. Thank you. I much. have one for Robert. So thank you, Raymond. I'm going to get Robert up here. The question would be for Robert, for those who have power roles in life that require us doing tough tasks and terminating employees, how do we reconcile the job requirements with the negative impact we know that we'll have on people? These decisions are often very tough and may result in, uh, in something positive later, but at the moment, you know, having to deal with this. So how would you respond to someone having to do a tough job in a power position, knowing what you know now? Well, somebody has to do it. Um, <laughs> I, I realize that. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's just now going to be me again. That's, uh, and I realize that too. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, even in my role today, I have people that get a hold of me because of my personnel background. And we talk about progressive discipline and how to document things and, and do all different types of things. But I do not want the responsibility of talking to somebody and affecting their lives. Um, that's just my own personal uh, so that's what I came back with I, I don't want to do it and and 
I'm not going to do it. <laughs> uh, and so uh, that's the best way I can answer it. it I, it's, it's needed. It's just, I personally just don't want to do it. Okay. And that's the best way I can answer it. Okay, that's that was fair. a great question, but thank it, you for the question. That is, that is a really good question, right? And and I like what you said that somebody has to do it, and if it really gets to you, you do have choice at some point. So we have choice in everything. So thank you, Robert. Uh, now this one is for Yvonne. Okay, this one is: Were you given knowledge that that we all have a pre-birth plan? So any in between state information about maybe soul contracts? What the pl what's the plan, yeah. man? Well, what, what I can say is um, that is not what I experienced. I know a lot of people think that, oh, you know, we sit there and people say, well, if you choose root A, this is what's going to happen, or you choose root B, that this is what's going to happen. And that is absolutely not what this soul experienced. What this soul experienced was that when I was in that realm of light, I so absolutely trusted the higher power and just absolutely got it that our intelligence and capacity to understand is like a grain of sand compared to the infinite ocean of intelligence, which is that cosmic higher power past, present, and future. So for me to choose what is best for my soul as compared to the higher power saying, this is what your soul needs, like, duh, I'd be pretty stupid <laughs> if I would think that I could even begin to choose what is better for my soul. It rather, I was experiencing this profound state of surrender. I was experiencing a state of surrender, of love, and of trust. And when I was told the higher choice is to go back to the injured body, it'll be more difficult, but to go back to the injured body, there wasn't even a flicker in my soul. I, I was... I was in a complete state of surrender. And I tried to live, I didn't get to that point in one of the after effects, but I tried to live that way in a state of surrender. Surrender to the divine will and openness to listen. I mean, this is another thing I've really realized. It's, and, Ra, and Raymond just spoke about this. We have to learn to listen. So that's part one, but then part two, is to surrender and trust that wisdom. And if we go against what spirit is guiding us, boy, will we pay the price. I mean, you know, hopefully we don't have to learn that lesson too many times in an incarnation. So, so for me, no, there was no sitting down and making a choice and picking your parents or anything like that. It was the, the higher, for me, maybe some people do get that experience. That was not what my experience, my experience was, I was guided, this is the higher choice for you. And I accepted that. So that was my choice. Do I accept what spirit is saying is the higher path for me or not? And I accept it. And, and what I want to do, I'd like to ask really quickly, the others, if you've got, to, if you want to chime in on that, and then somebody's very curious and actually uh, you kind of skimmed over that. Oh, I'm a guy somewhere else. <laughs> they want to know about the multiple bodies. Look, if I knew where all mine were, I, you know, I could possibly be jealous. I don't know. Does anyone want to chime on about given decisions or not, or how the soul contracts work real quick, just to finish up? Um, if you have a different perspective, if not, we'll keep going. No. Okay, good. They're good. Okay. So uh, the question, what about, uh, what does it mean uh, when you have a number of bodies at the same time, maybe expand on what you were saying early, earlier. Okay. That, that's asked at me again. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other people have written about this. I'm not the only person who's written about this, that, um, that you can be incarnated in more than one place at the same time. In a very, very famous book, Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, um, he gives uh, more than one case example of people who were in more than one place at the same time, that one can materi be materialized in more than one place at the same time. And in yoga and Buddhism, these sorts of phenomena are understood. Um, you know, they've been studying consciousness for thousands of years, but it's in our limited worldview, we think it's not possible. 
right? So why couldn't our soul split and duplicate and be in more than one place at the same time if time is an illusion when you're on the other side? So <laughs> absolutely. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's see. And this is for everybody. So I'll put it back on me. The question would be, do you, do you have to have an NDE? Do you, do you have to have a near-death experience to be able to, uh, to go to the higher realms, to be able to have this big spiritual awakening? Uh, does anyone, whoever wants to answer on that? Raymond. I, I would say you don't have to. I would say um, I would follow on what um, Yvonne has just said. It's, it's, it's about listening. The, the, for me, the whole key to this is sensitivity, you know, it, that, so I was already doing this before I had my, my NDs. Um, I was already a seer, um, and, but I learned those skills through listening. I went down every other avenue other than the correct one. And as, as, uh, as um, Yvonne said, it is, it is the sensitivity and it is listening to you, to your intuition. What does that, what does that tell me? So, and then you can build on that, you know, speak to speak to speak to us contact us again you know if, if you if you're not too sure but i would always say it's about just listening to, yes. to what you're being told and then robert you had your finger up <laughs> yeah i just i just i wanted to emphasize this that this organization spiritual awakenings international was created by listening to spirit and um when yvonne was president of ions and i was vice president of ions we both experienced like downloads. And I remember telling her, I think we we're at the wrong organization. And uh, so we started this with Linda Truax. And um, look what's happening when you're phenomenal. Wow. So, but that's from listening. This, this panel was based upon listening to a download. So you have to listen. You have to pay attention to that. And believe me, it's it's there. It slaps you in the face if, <laughs> if you want it. And I'm going to add one more comment, and then I know we're out of time. Yeah. But uh, somebody once said to me, you know, because I've you know started all these organizations and now started a new one and written all these books, like how do you do all of this, Yvonne? And and a, a wise person once said about me, she knows how to listen. And we're talking about listening to spirit. Yes. And that's how I met you, Dr. Kaysen. Spirit told me to contact you and gave me a whole download. That doesn't happen all the time. I actually got a download in everybody. So uh, <laughs> I, I've lived life the other way. It doesn't work so well. It's, a, it's much better to surrender. So there's so many more questions, but we, I know we were running out of time. We have about 10 minutes before the next speaker. So we'll probably have to go into break. I thank all of you just so much. I mean, it's just- so much wisdom and I would like to see more on this phenomena too. You don't see that. So thank you all so much and continue what you're doing. And thank you for letting me be a part of it. This is really special. Everyone in the gallery, it, it, this is just super special. So thank you. Thank you.